Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to the Tianova Lessons of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Tai Chi Lover. Or Tai Chi Lover. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. But in the meantime, we're still in Malaya, still struggling to make sure that we can get all the uh, product testing done, but it's a living. Some of these clients were obnoxious, others were officious, so still others salacious, and the really bad ones were duplicitous. But all told, dealing with them was better than the alternative, Khan Yut Kyung thought. He wished he could work with his father's bank again, but he knew that wasn't a possibility anytime soon. That bank, the Bank of East Asia, had gotten out of the Second Sino-Japanese War more or less intact because of its connections to the Japanese personnel in the area. But even the Japanese assurances were not, not enough to convince the Khan family to keep the bank's assets in the area when Guangdong was carved out in China. Most of the bank's goods and half of his large family transferred overseas to America mostly for their own safety and carried on from there. The husk of the bank was made a Yasuda subsidiary and Yu Kyung was forced to register for a Zhujin status in order to continue law practice. Or to practice law. I was troublesome for Yu Kyung, watching his old man for Zujin or no Zujin. He was Cantonese by ancestry and proud of it, ruined by injustice and cruelty. More aggravating was the fact that he could not uh, but keep silent, even though he knew that he could not last forever. He could perhaps should have fled, but he stopped himself from doing so by arguing that he had chosen the life he had now had anyways. So he decided day after day to get the best out of it while seeing that what he, what, while he could still do, or see what he could still do. So it played out, and 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 in the beginning. The truck carrying the Lee family abruptly stopped in front of a drab uh, building complex, where a couple of stained murky windows provided a glimpse into the conditions within, with rows of rusting old bunk beds and mildew infested walls. The facility was formed, and a Japanese man of short stature stepped forward and crassly demanded that the Lee family get to the street, or get out and get settled, brandishing his truncheon. Hey, his younger brother paid no heed to the unsubtle threat. What gives you the authority to dictate what we do? You people forcibly drag us out of our new ho out of our home, and now expect us to follow your rules? The foreman merely uh, looked amused before striking hay across the face of the truncheon. Chun saw red and stepped forward, and he faintly heard his mother imploring him to not do anything rash before he slapped his, the foreman on the side of his face. The foreman drug Chun by his collar onto the streets and two treating blows in the uh, fading dusk light. A passing police officer rushed over, reprimanding the foreman for treating workers in such a way. The foreman, eyes bulging, spat messlessly into the policeman's face before storming back into the dormitory, slamming the door in the faces. You all better not get any more trouble around here, the officer said, wiping saliva from his face. Come on. The chief of ten tenements are in town on this way. If you still have anything, you might just muster enough cash to get a little place. Chun's mother may. Profusely thanked the policeman as the family followed behind him. Chun glanced at the officer's badge, unsure whether to thank or to curse him for getting in between him and his detestable foreman. Officer Hayashi Kosen. So we're here. We have like no no weapons because I've been continually attacking. So we need quite a bit of stuff here now. Especially experimental infantry equipment, but we'll get that in due time. Uh, they are attacking there, which would be good for us, but still. Um, yeah, we just need more rifles. Motorized equipment, support equipment, that'll come in time. I'm not super worried about that. And let me don't do that. Do that, do that. On the 1962 product launch, Matsushita, champion of domestic appliances, has recommended that the W31 air conditioning union, where previous air conditioning units have required substantial alterations to the building itself, largely limiting their use of commercial and new residences, the W31 unit can be installed in windows with minimal alteration to its whole structure. This promises a new age of comfort and productivity, while workers can no longer claim the punishing summer heat as an excuse for low output. Sony Pioneers of Audiovisual Technology has proposed the TC962A to have the home audio system for the future. The audio players are revolutionary in that it allows users to enjoy and record while on quality recordings on magnetic tape reels in a compact package, adding both form and functionality against le legacy photographs common in urban households. Early observations have indicated considerable popularity among well-to-do Zhujin households, though extensive circuitry testing is needed prior to release. Fujitsu, a computing giant, suggested the Fa Falcom 2222, or 222, a mainframe computer already enjoying praise from the key industry figures the fastest of our time. Boasting a processing prowess of up to 6,250 operations per second, it could potentially become the digital new backbone of financial institutions all across the sphere, relieving the strain of a repetitive task from fallible human staff. Chief Executive Suzuki sank into deep thought. Our fruitful collection indeed, but this isn't just about the market. Whatever of those four companies gets ahead in the product launch most likely gains significant influence in the Legislative Council. What should he subsidize, if any, at all? I really, actually, I don't, I don't mind better air conditioning. That'd be really good above all. That's not bad, too. Um, a new player will enter the field of consumer electronics. You open mind, see what turns out. Hmm. I like efficiency, though. I actually like efficiency a whole lot. You know, I, I am a Sony pony, so. Support in the state. You know what? I expect government support. Sure, why not? Um, even though I don't mind computational power. You know what? We're going to do that about efficiency. Alright. Subsidized launch. With the finalization of the product trials, the time is coming to su offer subsidies to the company we have supported in the product release. With such government incentives, we'll certainly produce more. Profits are likely to shoot out of the roof, and the support in the Legislative Council will follow suit. While we're bound to lose some 
income and the tax breaks offered to the company to promote healthy development. Suzuki has little doubt that the profit from sales will earn the administration back its money after all. If investment turnout is going to be make riches anywhere, it'll be in Guangdong. Maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I won't do that. We'll see in the end. Um, regions of Guangdong, of course. Support is 51 ish percent. Ah, so we do all sorts of stuff here ish, whatnot. Decreased police control, huh? Interesting. Increase liquid reserves. Can't buy tie. Police. Triads. Decreases triad control of the state. So, who do you want to control by? Can't buy tie triads. Have reserve police. Interesting. Because, uh, Macau. Kenpai Tai. Monthly corruption goes up. How do we lower corruption? Monthly corruption goes down with the police. Maybe getting more police all over the place would probably be best. Because I don't want any more corruption. Monthly Chinese government support and state. I don't mind the expats, but I still want less corruption. Yakuza have this. Government support. We increase the Chinese or the police presence. That wouldn't be bad either. It's pretty low though, but there's not really much we can really do about it right now. So now we'll keep doing that too. Subsidize the launch and check the budget. Now comes the time where we must compile the reports and read the bureaucrats are harder work crunching the numbers. Our GDP and products launches are the most important statistics. As such, we're ensuring that it looks good as possible. We must ensure that Guangdong remains an attractive place for investments, for we need money, and money makes the world go around. Opportunity casts. Xin Dao was a simple man, an average accountant, an average banking firm on the island of Samanto, and he'd been okay with his own happy go luckiness as long as it earning him just about his own paycheck. 25,000 yen a month, to be exact, to sustain a somewhat restrained yet enjoyable lifestyle. The wild of his fantasies evolved street cafes, catching up with the year's baseball season on the couch and nothing more. Uh, then it happened over, almost overnight. The complete overhaul of the company command structure and initialization of total conversion to computerized management. So the mo next morning, Shin Do woke up to the news of whopping 7,500 yen slashed off his monthly wages. The fund the immediate installation of 335 Falcom 222 modules smushed to his horror. It said, had been aching ever since his morning from the prospect of tightening his belts and saying farewell to the street cafe dreams. He's seen those steel-clad dudes at work, and he knew what they were capable of, but why would that matter worth any more with the lives of actual human employees like him thrown into disarray? He was never one to plan ahead for changes. For him for six, let alone those dictated by a little more than some corporate backstage string pulling and threatening his humble lifestyle. Yet his society dissipated, and his gaze shifted from his desk to the metal behemoths, perching silently by the door. Uh, he saw the bigger picture. Challenge fosters opportunity, after all. With the majority of the company dragged back to the starting line, it wouldn't hurt for him to start anew and pick up a new skill or two. Perhaps he could even mold himself into expert of sorts by the time his paycheck returns to normal. Shin Dao was a simple man, but he was savvy enough to recognize that his future, and that of the entire company is anything but. So I lived rewarding, relentlessly commanding. Enter this product cycle as Fujitsu. Product quality between 15 and 25%. Oh. Every product cycle would get access to a wide variety of decisions to prove qu product quality and interest. Fourth electronics conglomerate of Guangdong is a Nissan subsidiary of Hitachi, led by Komai Kenichiro. The business strategy focuses on understanding its competition by selling highly profit, power, power efficient electronics. Hmm. Well, let's take a look at that real quick. Does the mic just go back and redo that? Oh, the jungle environment too. We need a mountainous conditions. That's not bad. That's nice. Miracle. Because we were boosting this one up quite a bit. This one. Power efficiency. A place of leisure. Oh, look at this. Though it would be easy to dismiss Macau as the least important of the three pearls, they do so to ignore the shadowy but enormous importance of the role the underworld plays in the sphere. And its massive and glittering plows of sin, Yakuza bosses and Tsurai leaders complete, compete in flamboyant demonstrations of wealth, power, and prestige. Outside the casinos and clubs and the dingy alleyways that lit by the only distant gleam of neon lights, they compete instead in cruelty and violence. If Koshi was the central hub of industry in Guangdong, and Hong Kong was its financial core, then Macau marks the nerve center of the sprawling networks of organized crime that operated across the state. The city's proximity to Hong Kong is no accident. With the corporate world and the under underworld often being so connected, one can mix it up the two. The wanton violence on the streets of the three perils serves a dual purpose, keeping the workers terrified and handling issues that cannot be directly handled in the boardroom is in a more direct fashion. Every unexplained murder, sudden suicide, street dismemberment, even the beheadings, all of them could be traced back to a clandestine meeting conducted somewhere in Macau if we wanted to try hard enough. Though, of course, anyone who did often met the same fate. Now more and more money flows in the coffers of the man that rule the city's gambling becomes his most lucrative export of the sphere. Underworld bosses, industrial barons, the chief executives of top corporations. 
all of them. You need a place to relax, show off, and most importantly, conduct unsavory business. And this, more than anything else, the city provides. So this is Silicon Delta. Specifications, they're performing. Close to none. Above average product profitability. Huh. Ideas of ministers, interesting. It's, the success will be terrible. Click on the bar to see effects. Bar? Um, I don't see anything here. Target market, no focus. Oh, here we go. Uh, product release deadline. Takes a lot of time to build trust and instant to lose it. We made a promise to our shareholders that we would deliver results of product that will shake the world and fatten their wallets at least once every year. So it's our option to ask for a delay or release an unprepared product to the world. But we should be careful. For to forego release entirely, we put credibility on the line. Test the product rigorously. Oh, we need a lot of political power. The next business week will be entirely devoted to testing prototypes and implementing refinements to our current project under development. The market has come to expect from us a good degree of refinement and sophistication during our products, and we have an obligation to meet or exceed these expectations. If only to maintain our share values and bolster our company's image among our peers and competitors. Hire more skilled engineers. A concept is worth nothing without its execution. It takes more than just ideas of marketing to successfully launch a product. It also requires reliability, good construction, and well thought out design. If hiring a few more well trained hands for our development team is necessary to keep our product up to the high standards of the market, then that's what we'll have to do. Move factory workers to QA. The QA process encourages their learning from failure and consistent small changes to improve a product. This process takes time, however, and manpower for product testing is not often our top priority. Instead of expanding our dedicated quality assurance staff, it'll be much cheaper to simply divert some of our factory workers to testing prototype models. In their spare time, or even on their factory floors or break rooms, if the product in question has uses in those settings. Granted, it's not a part of our formal job description, and some workers may be ignored in position, but you ought to know that in Guangdong, no rule or role rule is absolute. Move white collar workers then. And it's not part of the formal job description, and some workers may be ignored in the imposition, but they ought to know that in Guangdong there's no rule or ru role or rules. Absolute. Okay. There's only so many hours in a day, and only so many days in a week, and only so many weeks in a product cycle. In Guangdong's cutthroat environment, any delays in our part could have disastrous consequences for our product, more importantly, our product's profitability. It's somewhat distasteful, but we can best taste in the development of the current project by mandating overtime for all engineers. Let's invite like grumbling from the engineers, of course, and the world will quickly reach back to both their fellow Japanese expats and home isles. Lone engineers from Japan. So far, we relied on our own men to design and develop our latest product. Well, normally they are perfectly adequate for our needs. If we want to go above and beyond the quality, standard quality the market is used to, we'll need to pull from Japan's considerable talent pool. By pulling in our contracts or contacts through our offices in the home aisles, we can arrange to have the best engineering talent the sphere has to offer transfer temporarily to our current projects here in Guangdong. Some feathers may get ruffled here and there, as well as pull high demand skilled labor for our own needs, but all our loans will be repaid in full. I have no fear. Sacrifice R&D. Decrease research speed for all effectiveness. Wow. That's pretty major. Even during the product cycle, in which the majority of our resources are put towards the goal of profitable release, we maintain our public research and development division. In this case, however, we cannot afford to maintain two fronts. We will divert further resources and manpower from the R&D teams to active product development. Our research will suffer on all fronts while we pursue this more focused approach, but the quality of our product will be greatly improved. Affords police prototyping. Okay, interesting. The Guangdong police can occasionally prove useful just beyond how long we're on the streets. As we move into the testing phase of the development cycle, we require as much data as possible. Since the state already pays their salaries, it would be simple to send prototypes and test models their way. Most of our products have at least some use in the office setting, either for discharge of their duties or their own downtime. As a matter of sending out a few will place bribes, it's simple enough to accomplish, although pushing our products under the police is too often it's likely to strain a relationship and let the camp by tally test the products. If the Kenpai Tai insists on serving as the eyes and ears of Japan, looking around in every nook and cranny of the Pearl River, then at the very least they should be expected to give back to the bottom line in some way. Their agents should have plenty of use for the top of the line technology, and whether they choose our products in the field or in their offices, it makes no matter to us. As long as they give our R&D teams useful feedback, they can do whatever they want with it. It goes without saying that they'll expect something in the way of compensation for this assistance, but we'll deal with that them in another time. Interest decisions now. Prepare advertisement campaign. Pay off high ranking uh, uh, contacts. When it comes to product advertising, Pays have the right person in your corner, literally. In a market as cutthroat as Guangdong, having the right endorsements or product quality att attestations is the difference between success and failure, and as such, we have to make sure that the regulators, auditors, and promotional agents will have whatever they need to agree that we are the only game in town. Hold a massive press rally. Nothing gets publicly quiet like a good press conference. We can make a massive splash with the right setting of well, some well chosen words and plenty of incentives for the press, naturally. Such an event comes at a price, but as with any investment, the points deliver a tight return. Any expenses made now will seem trivial once potential customers watch the conference on their home TVs and read all about it in their morning paper. Buy Mastery of Airtime. With each passing year, the TV is becoming the premier medium of those choice. 
of choice for those with extra money to spend. While its extraordinary value is still a marketing tool, we must be conscious that it is still not a universal. In contrast, there are hardly any households in Guangdong, China, and Japan that lack at least one radio set, to say nothing of radios out in the public spaces. The buzz of radio static can be heard across stores, open shop fronts, and even offices all across the great age and co-prosperity sphere. It may be more cautious, safe marketing tactic, but risk-taking in and of itself is not a goal. A uh, profit is. It's not bad. A bribe channels for air, TV airtime. <coughs> Time is money. Such an adage is hardly less true for the television. Television in Guangdong is just as cutthroat as every, every other industry. Companies are forced to vie for airspace and television executives are all too aware of how much value their services command. If we want to get word of a product to uh, television shuts across the sphere, we need to deal with these executives directly and increase the wheels, such as the cost of business. Oops, my bad, that was my phone. Uh, force overtime for factory workers. The development of a product is one piece of the puzzle. If we cannot produce enough units to meet the demand we generate, then all of our efforts will have been wasted. But pushing our workers to their limits, we can ramp up our production. The workers will not like it, but they have few options to protest our decision, however. The workers will have ways of making their dissatisfaction known. The public will hear of it for one, and the workers will not soon forget regardless of whether or not they show it now. It will be up to us to determine if it's a worthy choice. Use underworld context. In the public, we have nothing to do with the unsavory likes of the tribes or Yakuza unofficially, however. We should always be willing to make a deal. We have plenty of clandestine contacts with these organizations and a few favors accrued over the years for services rendered. If we want to, we could call a few of these favors in and have them drum up some interest for our upcoming product amidst Guangdong's seedier underbelly. Suppress negative press. There will always be flies in the ointment, so to speak. Even the best designed product is bound to catch unfair criticism for one perceived fault or another. Whether it be working conditions, product safety, or complaints overpricing, complaints overpricing, we can always expect some nuisance from the media. Luckily, the press can be dealt with in the same fashion as everyone else in the Pearl River Delta. Money. Some yen wave around here or there, and our headaches will quietly dissipate. There's a lot of these options we have. Hide. Oh, sell to the Japanese market. Huh. This is interesting. The Empire of Japan is a master and patron. It is only natural for us to repay their support with the fruits of their investment. The Japanese consumer is a beneficiary of the economic sphere that reaches across the breadth of the Pacific and has reached the rewards of such cooperation. The Japanese consumer, more than anyone else in the sphere, is primed and able to be a reliable market for innovative products. Focusing our efforts on the Japanese market is not only historically proven uh, sound choice, but remind Tokyo of our loyalty and trustworthiness, better for securing economic and political positions. The Chinese government would no doubt be displeased. Some of the Republic have been calling for us to get average for giving the average Chinese consumer greater access to our products, but that is, I'll have to wait for another year. Market our products to Japan. Sell to the Chinese markets. Sometimes the most obvious solution to a problem is the most effective one. Currently, the problem facing us is one of maximizing profits for the latest development cycle. And the solution? Maximizing our potential consumer base to promote the greatest volume of sales. Who better turn into that case than our neighbors in the Republic of China? True, they may not have the most sophisticated palettes or technology, but what they lack in discerning taste, they have more than make up for the sheer numbers. But focusing our efforts on advertising and developing for the Chinese masses, we can break into a great and an underappreciated well of buyers. Provided they can pay for the product, of course. This should show, uh, a, a show of attention to the Chinese would not only endear our neighbors to us, but also get our administration some support amongst our own working class. Some Tokyo will raise an eyebrow, but the fact of the matter is that if they expect us to turn a profit on their behalf, then they must be willing to allow us to conduct our business on our sound market principles. Get more chance of government support and more opinion. Product profitability does not go up, though. Push a product launch forward. We could do this one as well if we need to. Thanks to an incredibly productive development cycle, our latest product is actually viable for release before the end of the mandated launch deadline. Not only do we have an opportunity here to release early, but we can also effortlessly translate this turn of events into some excellent marketing. Consumers and investors alike will be thrilled by the news of our product's advanced launch, which will surely boost its profitability. Delay it, though. We could do that, too. It's not easy to admit any, by any means, but the fact is that our current product is simply not ready for release by the point of the deadline. To release it then would invite disaster. A defective, poor quality product that will so terribly and completely tarnish our hard worn reputation. Delaying the launch will, be, will, of course, have its own downsides. Consumers tend to be fickle beasts and react poorly to the perceived signs of failure. That will simply have to be born. However, the alternative is an utter embarrassment at the, at the side of the market. So that's all interesting stuff we can have. We have 29% corruption now. That actually gives them more daily political power and better Chinese monthly support. So that's actually really good. Uh, as we do all this stuff. And we're checking the budget, but then we'll sort of the police situation. Police in our fractured state of Guangdong have been long plagued by more than only crime as of late. A number of problems have arisen that have severely compromised their ability to combat crime on their own, including inefficiency, corruption, limited forces available, unwillingness to combat entrenched criminal elements. The list continues. Suzuki has determined that the current situation demands change. Though many are all too aware that these efforts are set to achieve limited effect. 
At the very least, the chief executive hopes he will be able to organize the meager force in a better shape for the sake of the people and our territory's security. Setting sail with an exasperated sigh, Chief Executive Suzuki lifted his head and warily from the stack of paper, his mind lingering on the contents as he gazed through the office window once more at the Pearl River waters glimmering under the twilight, punctuated by distinct silhouettes of freighters lazily, lazily uh, gliding along the shores. Oh, I can't read. Ever since his assignment to the post not long ago, Suzuki had developed a habit of picturing this landmass beneath him as a gargantuan groaning freighter. His office building its commanding tower, and the four companies' rocks lurching beneath the waters were threatening to sink it. But now, for the first time in office, Suzuki felt confident he'd gotten a clear picture of the waterways. Navigating through all those dazzling novelties Sony Matsushita and Fujitsu had to offer had been an easy task, but with the diligence of statistics, staff, as well as a bit of his own intuition, now we at least had the fittest release candidates in mind. And those the place of peasants. Unfortunate souls, as some may claim, Suzuki simply could not bring himself to sympathize with, the with their woes at the moment. The package of mass imperial, massive mineral yields plus cheap labor was simply too much of a godsend to pass up. Numbers don't lie, after all. Suzuki shifted his gaze back to the stack of reports. Before he knew he was already back at work shuffling through the papers, scrambling down last minute comments on one page and instructions for tweaking on another. Only vessels built from the impenetrable steel can weather the heaviest of storms. And right now, Suzuki can already see the seal plates falling into plates as he stands tall and proud of the helm of the traitor named Guangdong. And it's readier than ever for the most glorious voyage. But first, keep our benefactors on board. Hmm. We need more political power. Me with the Kenpai Taika Ban. Japan's relationship with Guangdong has become complicated. The situation has been muddled, uh, muddled further by a looming presence of the Kenpai Tai over the Legislative Council. Despite uh, normally being an ally of the government, the Kenpai Tai remain unwavering in their loyalty to Japan, acting as its eyes and ears, occasionally going as far as it becomes its fists. The chief executive knows this and tends to meet with the Colonel Miyazaki Kiyotaka. To try and bring him into line, though no matter what assurances Suzuki makes, it will be little what that will stop the Kenpai Tai from following its own agenda. Even such actions will be a detriment to our future. Stanley Ho's amazing commodities. Uh, mostly unusual business. No, we can do this one. Uh, but I kind of want to do this one. Let's see what this one's like. Stanley Ho's amazing commodities. Stanley Ho is a distinguished gentleman within the higher echelons of society in Guangdong, trading his abundant wealth into power and influence. Despite being both the Chinese and Dutch descent, a sore thumb amongst the Japanese establishment. Ho rose to prominence by delivering copulent luxuries from across the sphere and outside in Guangdong, with a particular taste for illicit contraband. Few doubts could have done so without the help of the elusive triads, though, of course, any links to criminal activity are unproven in the eyes of the public. Stanley Ho will prove integral to Suzuki's hopes to, of bringing security to the streets of Guangdong, even if it may mean cozying up to the triads. Also, right now, instead of uh, the other one, we have now gone with the Silicon Delta version of the TC962, a home audio system with Sony. Easy to use, a playback speaker. We did target the Empire of Japan, average, above average of a pro uh, profitability. Uh, we have a middling product quality and low interest, which is not good. So no matter what happens, we got to make sure this thing is very interested or garners a lot of interest from those consumers. So to increase government, Chinese government support in the state, whatever. I'll do whatever it takes to make sure that we're successful. Also, the American tanks have landed, and they're trying to blow us up. So um, in the meantime, pay off hot ranking contacts. Sure, why not? Maybe I should have waited to do this one. Oh no, I might have to replay all this again. We'll see what happens in the end. Hmm. Yeah, there's a lot go there's a lot going on here. This is just so much. I like it. I love what the desert done with this. One of the comments from the last video says, uh, you have about a week to play this before a uh, hotfix comes out to update uh, you know, TNO and whatnot. So that's what apparently one of the devs said. So to if the devs are watching, thank you very much for making this and continuing to make TNO a great mod. Thank you so much. It's it's an amazing mod, my favorite. Meeting with the Colonel. Even the office of Colonel Miyazaki Kiyotaka seemed to do all could to appear formidable. Every surface, every corner, every object was kept immaculate and in order, as would be expected for a man with un 20 uncompromising years of experience in the Kenpai time. Chief Executive Suzuki carefully maneuvered himself through the room until he was opposite Kiyotaka. Once in position, he moved to begin the meeting in earnest. Geno Miyazaki, uh, it's my pleasure to work with a man as experienced as and able as yourself. I'm sure that it is, Suzuki. Now, what is it? What do you want with me? Suzuki was silently taken back by the bluntness of the colonel, but he pressed on nevertheless, aware of the weight of the man in front of him carried, irrespective of Suzuki's personal feelings. I come to realize that there has been a rise in some rather unsavory methods employed by the Kenpai Tai. While I would never question the necessity, I implore you to request your officers to carry out their duties more inconspicuously in the future. As you should be aware, Chief Executive, an immediate answer is out of the question. I need to confer with a great deal of people before I can begin to consider altering Kenpai Tai operations in any ways you've implied. Kono Miyazaki paused for a moment so that Suzuki could endure his crippling uncertainty a little while longer before continuing, of course. It must appear as deem your intentions worthy, I will continue to ensure that the Kenpai Tai operates to the best of its considerable abilities. Kiyotaka's answer was of little substance, but it was encouraging enough to grow to the growingly irritated Suzuki. Aside from the colonel's inexorable insolence, the man had not been outright hostile to the idea of turning down the Kenpai Tai's activities. Perhaps he'll be receptive next time.
I want as much interest as possible in this thing. Uh, maybe the Japanese elite. The Japanese expatriate class in Guangdong, aristocrats, bankers, industrialists, investors, and generals. Hold political power and influence far in excess of their small numbers. Clustered in the urban heart of Koshu, Macau, and Hong Kong. Guangdong was largely established for the benefit in the tumultuous period after the war, and even if we feel that their actions were self-serving the extreme, we can't risk running afoul of them and having them raise a ruckus. Fortunately, though, uh, they would do anything to protect their interests against the Ch Cantonese, Japanese, and especially the Chinese, and that same self-interest can be easily applied to, and Suzuki's no stranger to winning and w whining and dining, the elite. Great. The general and the colonel. Fresh from his meeting with the chief executive Suzuki, Colonel Miyazaki, marched down the hallways of the Imperial Japanese Army headquarters in the Koshu at the brisk pace, his shine boots clicking mechanically against the marble tiling. He had two masters in Guangdong, having negotiated with one, now he had to report to the second. He stopped briefly in front of the commanding officer's palatial office, before noting that the lights were out and the sign on the door was a flip to absent. It wasn't a surprise, the ancient marshals and generals commanding the IJA garrison in Guangdong were all well and past their prime. The real power lay in the smaller, less ostentatious office next door. Commanding the baritone voice of Lieutenant General Nagano Shigeto rang clearly into the hallway after Miyazaki announced himself, so what did our chief executive say? He questioned our methods as usual. Miyazaki's report was blunt as it was mocking. I told him that we would consider his complaint if necessary. Necessary it is not, Nagano stated empathetically. The police are ineffectual and corrupt, and its own resources are finite. If you cannot address the deficiencies in the police, then we must pick up the slack in our own way. We change nothing until Suzuki asks again, and then I'll have Tokyo intercede. Miyazaki ignited in an affirmation, as Nagano stood and walked to the Shin Gunto hanging on the wall. The chief executive, as experienced as he is, does not know the Chinese as we do. Colonel, politicians always ask the impossible when it comes to the China front, without acknowledging the costs involved. But pay the cost we must, such as our fate as military men, and 13 orphans. And then he gives me this crap-eating grin, and what does the cheating old dude do? Screw and luckily pulls a green dragon from the wall, takes half a week's pay with it. All honors, he says, the effing nerve, if I see the guy again. You'll start paying me your, your own drinks? For your own drinks? Asks Nagai Wan, and then he gets a large wooden crate, dabbing his face with a sweat rag. No, get humped again, came a uh, shot from across the unloading area. Yuan likes getting humped by old men. Up yours, Brex, said Yuan. Me, I'm 30 years too young for your tap lover, boy. Really? There's plenty of sailors out there waiting for you, retorted Yuan, gesturing out towards Port Shorty, and the tanker ship spilling out an endless load of cargo into purpose built storage facilities. Yeah. And they're waiting for you to move so they can get around this, get out of this place, roared the foreman. Quit, 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 uh, screwing around. Sorry, boss said Nagai Wan, making an awkward twist while grabbing the nearest crate. He attempted to step forward, but the ground slipped beneath him. The crate lid shattered under his weight. As he struggled to right himself and recover from the shock, fellow workers rushed towards him and he saw the powder. Pouches upon pouches of uh, Just in that one box, the reddish brown of congealed blood, raw opium, and unexpected hand. So we're now we're high for interest, which is good. Um, essentially how a product will be received, we're going to make a bad product good. The quality has to be very good, so at least get at least high for the quality now. 5%. I wish we had more political power. We're actually really close to 12. Ooh, that's not bad. Yeah, we're going to do that one. Hire more skill engineers. Definitely do that one. That'll give us a big old boost. I don't want more product interest. I want us to do gangbusters with this thing, man. Huge gangbusters. <coughs> this charming man. Are you talking about me? Oh. Stanley Ho reclined in his seat, effortlessly giving off the air of a man of the pinnacle of life, yet still hungry for more. He made a welcoming gesture to Suzuki and a signal for him to take the adjacent seat. Oh, his gaze drifted beyond the glass window pane after the vibrant signs that crisscrossed above the heaving streets below. In all my years of travel, nothing exhilarates me as much as the rush of Guangdong. In my experience, I find that one learns more about their homeland the more they travel, and only here have I found such a resolute drive, a full bloody desire to go beyond limits and tradition to achieve the impossible. You can appreciate the irony. Guangdong itself is an impossible creation, yet its people devote themselves to unending, relentless aspiration in spite of it. It's quiet, Suzuki said, swallowing his breath. He found himself wanting to nod along to the Temple of Ho's words, despite knowing better. He tended to change the course of the conversation, only for Ho to interrupt. Now, no one knows how to wield this energy better than I do. I, I'm attuned to this place, his desires and fears, in a few way, few are. If you were to succeed in this land, in any matter, great or small, you will need my help. Ho master threat with a broad grin, which was met by a minuscule, unwavering nod from Suzuki. And if you let me, I see no reason why we cannot get on quite amiably, Chief Executive. As Vinny concluded, Suzuki fought the urge to loosen his tie, making, masking his frustration as how easily Ho had disarmed him. He would catch himself tugging at his collar for the rest of the day. A kind yet dangerous man. Core of the Jap Cantonese Japanese. The Cantonese Japanese, the Zujin in the local Cantonese, are a myriad of and diverse lot. A collection of local contractors, amenable, notables, popular entertainers, and the salaried civil servants of police that form the backbone of Guangdong's government. They've all come to realize that working with the Japanese and the cause of Pan Asianism is to their benefit, forming a class in between the Japanese expatriates and the Chinese poor so that can be counted upon to support the government. Taking care of them and reassuring them that their livelihood would not be trampled on by the Japanese and or endangered by the Chinese is absolutely essential. Good, good. I want more interest. More interest. Mm. Hmm. I don't want to decrease Japan's approval, though. Expat government support and state. Quality? That's not bad. That's pretty decent, too. 
Five percent is not enough. Chinese government. I don't want to disprove. Get, seven and a half is not bad. Ten percent. Um. Yeah. Probably raises corruption too. Actually, how bad is corruption right now? Oh, forty percent. That's not good. Maybe we should deal with less corruption then. Um, there's more interest. I mean, we've been pumping up it pretty badly so far. We just need one more political part. 10%. That's not bad. Uh, how about we stop doing corruption stuff? We do this one next too, probably. Not bad. I didn't realize how, bad, how, how badly high I was, I was making the corruption. Average profitability, huh? A party for investors. The glittering red lights of the Japanese trading ships passing through Victoria Harbor were silhouetted against the flickering lights of Kowloon, a suitably mesmerizing backdrop for the welcoming of the wealthy and powerful Japanese expatriates of Guangdong. Chief Executive Suzuki sipped politely at his wine. He wasn't entirely comfortable in such settings. A gathering of tuxedos, kimonos, and dresses adorned in false smiles and uh, tittering laughter, but he couldn't bite the hands of Fed Guangdong either. Suzuki's eyes narrowed as a rotund man approached. Baron Yasukawa? Suzuki recognized the man from his days in the House of Peers, a factor in Japan. Home islands are terribly restricted these days, Yasukawa replied, laughing. Guangdong seems an ideal place to expand, cheap and labor and all. After the two shared a toast, Yasukawa motioned for the woman beside him to introduce herself. Easily the youngest by some margin, her peacock blue cocktail dress contrasting with the subdued kimonos around them. My daughter, Yosho Iko. She's accompanying me, Baron Yasukawa introduced her after graduating from women's college. A pleasure to meet you, Chief Executive. Yosho Iko. Yoshiko. Yoshiko. Offered a flawless bow. My father always speaks highly of you. I'm flattered opinionated one, Suzuki thought. The words were polite, but she looked uh, Suzuki directly in the eyes for a fleeting second. He put her out of his mind. His business was with the bear, not with her. Help yourself to the refreshments, Miss Yasukawa. Motivated the chi motivate the Chinese workforce. Oh, yeah. The vast majority of the Guangdong's population, even the two de decades left later after the establishment of the territory, as composed of poor Chinese manual laborers and factory workers across both Guangdong's urban and rural regions. They are also, unsurprisingly, the most restive part of the population, and while most Japan, Japanese companies in Guangdong work them as hard as physically sustainable for meager pay, many find time to participate in the increasing number of dissident movements. For the time being, at least, Suzuki will authorize motivational actions for the Chinese shelving plans to shorten lunch hours. But an extra rest day on for once in every two months, if that is enough to keep them working without complaint, there are, of course, alternative methods of motivation. Hmm. Do that one. High interest, high quality. We need to save a lot of political power. Also, this is still going up too, which is really nice. And you're actually becoming like a jungle rat. Like this is kind of cool. How, how long have we got this going on? That's a lot of corruption we need to count on. We need mountainous stuff though. To Zhujin Guangdong. Chief Executive Suzuki had asked for Li Kaxing to present himself in Koshu for discussions, and Li had obliged. A faint smile forming as he sat on the opposite side of the desk, the noon light reflecting dimly on the balding head. What Suzuki had not expected, however, was for Morita Akayo to be accompanying Li, fixing the chief executive with a steely gaze. Morita, can't you go outside and wait? Suzuki cleared his throat. Whatever business you have with me, I'm sure we can discuss it later. And whatever you have to say to Li, you can say to me, Morita replied bluntly. If you want to work with us, you need to deal with both of us. Suzuki looked between the two, the two leading Zhujin of Guangdong, working hand in hand since the first emerged selling cheap transistor radios back in 55, and mentally conceding the point. There was a partnership that existed long before Suzuki had arrived, and he was going to open the court to Cantonese Japanese. The two would be entering the spotlight together sooner rather than later. A suck business, Suzuki said, reaching for a cigarette. If I can get your assistance to bring the Zhujin businesses and workers in the line with what I plan for Guangdong, I can assure that they're looked after. It's the best and only deal you'll get. The security situation. Good. After observing the three ethnic groups of Guangdong, Chief Executive Suzuki now has enough data to compile a report summarizing the security situation. A holistic evaluation of the policies concerning local security will provide an indicative estimate of how best to assess and improve the security situation, or at least. That's what we'll title the report to Tokyo, while Chief Executive Suzuki comes up with our next plan of action, of course. The TR-96A. Even in Guangdong, radios have become complex enough that even without the means, which is the vast majority of households, struggling to save enough money for a rainy day could keep up with the latest news, entertainment, and music. I have not by themselves, then through their next door one. Next door next neighbor. One can walk into any apartment complex in Guangdong and hear live or five different programs playing on the, any given floor. The cacophony could drown out the constant drone of the ubiquitous fans circulating new air in the enclosed spaces. But if you missed your favorite program, then that was it. No replays or recourse until maybe, just maybe, a rerun might play when you least expect it. Re-recordings were the province of professionals and studios, and amateur could only rely on luck. But with a TR-9621A, luck is only part of the question. Input, output, settings. 
Uh, and the ability to set up reels of magnetic film to record your favorite broadcast in equal fidelity to when they were first aired. <coughs> Assuming, of course, you had the magnetic tape to spare, which Sony was more than happy to provide. Incredible product interest. It's not the product that makes money, it's the ancillaries. Due to our product cycle reaching 77.25%, when averaging uh, product interest and quality, and our product productivity reaching 110%, gain the following effects. Increase Sony's leg co seats by two. A national spirit named the product cycle will be obtained with the following effects. More, two, more than 2% real growth. Growth goes up by 0.5%. Miscellaneous income goes up by over a billion. Because we market towards the Empire of Japan, we get the following effects. Increases approval loss by, by 3%, and decreases Chinese government approval by 1.5% in several different places. We get on the island event, and Japan gets event on the island due to the feature larger product requirements. Our initial product quality, interest, minimum, and maximums are reduced by 5%. Shnikes. 394 days. Jesus. We failed the deadline. Oh, shnikes. Um, I hope we did well. The regions probably don't like us very much. I do want to make sure we have more support for the police, though. That would be useful to have to help keep control of people. And help lower, actually, uh, corruption. I don't think corruption is too high. So we might focus on that and also start piling, supplying, stockpiling, I should really say. Um, holy shnikes. That's a lot of growth. Um, more growth. More political power. If we possibly can. Probably not, but we'll see. Sound fiscal health. The product cycle. Will be removed in January. So for the next like four months. Three months. We get way more growth. Mis more miscellaneous income. Real GDP growth. It's not bad. It's, it's interesting to see how that all worked out. Security theorem. Uh, we're not a big group here. Um, we'll probably do that. We're probably not really here geared for a large scale war. So, I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't think we're, that's really what we're aiming here for. So. We'll head to town. We're actually doing okay. I do want to lower the camp by influence, though. 34. That's not too far away. That's much further away. So, over here would probably be best to do it. And, uh, I don't want the triads. I want the police. Increases police control. Doing stuff like this would be better. 1.5, 1.25. Probably Macau would be a good one to do next on the Isles. Mitsui Sumitomo Mitsubishi. Names that conjure up all images of Marita's mind. Ibuka, Tokyo, telecommunications, and the horrors that came afterwards. The fear of the merciless bailiffs. The many nights he spent eating plain white rice on the floor of a dilapidated apartment in Hong Kong. He remembered selling his watch to a toothless peddler in the alleyway behind a restaurant for about half an hour for what it was worth. Yes, he and his Aibatsu had met before. Now with these men sitting before him, it all came flooding back. Neither Sumitomo nor Mitsui had bothered to show up, but Mitsubishi had sent some non-entity, and Toshiba had sent too, an audience for this farce. Morita had a fight to keep his, up, his lip, keep his lip from curling. That bald man, the one with the ridiculous purple tie, Morita recognized him from long ago, one of the Ibuka's lackeys maybe. Whoever he was, he was currently flashing Morita a smile, a sick enough to cut through steel girders. So good to see you again, Morita, the bald man said, his rectus grin widening, how was President Lee? The other representatives tried and failed to stop the giggles. Morita ignored the bait. Once this meeting was over, the representatives would head back to the cars and the chauffeurs would drive them out of the building's garage. As they turned the corner, they would spot a billboard advertising a TA-1120. That's been put up this morning. Dozens more would have joined over the coming weeks in major metropolitan areas, all coincidentally placed quite near local Zaibatsu headquarters. And that was something Morita would pay good money to see. Diamonds in the sky. There's a Lucy in the diamond sky in the diamonds, huh? To all loyal, diligent citizens of Guangdong, we hereby announce another series of their edicts, passed hours ago by the office of the chief executive. Most of them. Moved without, along without a sound, the old pa sitting by the grocery stand lifted his head up only slightly. The ears on his post had made Hayashi Kosen a sharp, observant man, keeping eyes and ears on all around him. His own distaste for such a habit aside, affected it today. All factories are to include one extra day of paid leave and labor contracts on a bi-monthly basis, granted with the utmost generosity by Chief Executive Suzuki, Tai Chi as a replenishment and a reward of those toiling for greater prosperity. The monotonous buzz of the TV set went on, but Hayashi's mind had already drifted elsewhere, nothing major then. There was a sigh from five meters away, the three middle-aged men in rags hurried by, one shooting him a disdainful glance and muttering obscenities under his breath. Hayashi offered no retort, for doing so would be professional misconduct, yet for the first time in months, something within him began to waver. To his colleagues who support superiors, it was just where the officer, the perfect Zhujin specimen and perseverance incarnate to himself, he was but a wanderer stranded between worlds, seen as, by, as an outsider by those above him and an outcast, a traitor even, but those left behind. The one persistent burden on his back, however, was his struggle for his paychecks, recognition for his own place in the society of artifice. And here he was today, confronted once again by the stagnant reality and the predicament of those, his own, of, those of his own blood. 
So Lam Chau Kion lost himself a thought until Hayashi Kosen stood back him and shook him all the way. He had a job to do after all, not to Tokyo. Ooh. The chief executive Suzuki's initial assessments of Guangdong's economic potential and security outlook complete. Suzuki prepares for a regular call with the Prime Minister of Tokyo to update him about his findings and to seek authorization for his plans to stabilize the territory over a longer, longer term. An update for Tokyo. The sun is setting. Orange soaks the city of Canton as the first lights are switching on for the coming night. Chief Executive Suzuki sits in his office, filling out the last of the paperwork for the day. It is his report to the Prime Minister Ino, the one thing that his career depends upon. His mandate is to bring Guangdong in line is being fulfilled, but it is this report and the PM Ino's subsequent response will determine his next move, of course. Uh, putting the pen down, Suzuki sits back. The last few months have been busy for him in the government. He's constantly at risk of losing everything at once, and the situation will be worse with this project, the Revised Labor Standards Ordinance. He rubs his temples, and his nerves firing too rapidly for his mind to handle. He needs every ounce of support he can get, and then some. It is through Tokyo where he helps get support. It'll take some persuasion, he realizes, for the Prime Minister himself has been skeptical of his recent efforts, but long-term stabilization of Guangdong needs Tokyo's full support. But the situation is untenable as is. Uh, the corporates have acted in their own interest for far too long, and keeping it this way only worsens the Chinese population is simply too large and the government too weak. This is the argument that he lays out in the file spread from, oh, in front of him. He wonders to himself, will it be enough? People of the Pearl. Excuse me, Professor. Kereko's uh, hand darted up in the second row, as he always did. You see the Zhujin as a demographic, as a natural consequence of the state of Guangdong, or, and its form formation. I struggle to understand just about what it is natural. It would make more sense if it made a, out of an ethnic Japanese-Chinese hybrid, but even that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, Suzuda Hayato froze, his gaze fixated on the pond of 50 heads before him. All Japanese faces, not one Chinese sitting here in a higher education S institute erected upon Chinese soil, and I, indeed. What about this is natural? Ever the Koyago? Confirm a no eavesdropper than your shiny side? That travesty of a language they cobbled up with Japanese manner in the upper Manchuria? That's exactly what they're doing with the Zuzhim. And you can even tell it's from the name. He slowly leaned over the podium, Zhu, Mandarin for Pearl, and Jin, Onyomi for People. Smack them together, and there you have it, a glistening new identity to pull it out for the more foreign missionaries, but he smiled for all existence of this newborn nation, past, present, and future. Except the Mansetsu and the Kwantung army, people had 27 years since the Russo-Japanese were to fabricate their fight a complete. Guangdong 12. Not enough for an ethnic hybrid to cross-breed itself in existence, and certainly not enough for the actual Chinese living to, on the soil to just give up on who they are, he paused. The Nanjing government was incensed with, with the idea back in in 1950, as they were the Guangdong's creation selves. Can you even blame them? The city of Guangdong is natural, he looked around, surveying the Kapana 50 shocked face before him. In the sense that Japan's crusade against Western imperialism is natural. That the spoils of war we robbed from the liberator are natural. There, that's your answer. As we will propose the revised labor standards ordinance. Oh boy. Suzuki surveyed both the economic and security situation in Guangdong, and what he found does not bode well for the future of the muddy, muddled nation. The chief executives found that preserving Japan's long-term rule over Guangdong would necessitate some form of compromise between the corporations and the people. What well, Suzuki has identified as a growing threat of ethnic time bomb, which is made worse by the day as companies relentlessly pursue quick profits above all else. Both the people and the firms uh, Guangdong will need placating before this conflict is brought to the fore. So the chief executive has determined the backlog of the future to sell must probably be drained by revising the current labor standards of the nation. This move will no doubt be unpopular with the businesses who rely on the cheap labor of Guangdong's current lax regulations allow, but change is needed now before the rising town of descent washes over uh, all of Suzuki's work away. Uh, some of the comments included, Go Hitachi, which we will eventually, sometime in another campaign probably, someone says, I gotta say, this mod just keeps getting better and better. Love the video. By the way, just want to ask, have you considered playing the Operation Deep Freeze sub for TNO? I wanted, I actually started making a recording video over it, but there was no focuses. And while I can still play games, you know, you know, you know, campaigns without focuses, I might go back and revisit it sometime because I have heard, a did get a couple updates and I would like to try it out sometime as well. So, someone says corporate capitalism is the best. Oh, absolutely. Uh, let's see. Oh, has support, sought support from less than two factions. Add five Sony seats. Educate, educate engineers. Five. Oh, geez, two seats. Five seats, five seats. So this one, right now we have 45% from Sony, 5 out of 12. Matsushita uh, has 3 out of 20, which sucks. We have no support from Fuji, Fujitsu, a little bit of support from Yasuda, and more support from Suzuku, Suzuki. I mean. So we need at least 13 seats, probably 14 seats in total. Really, we should probably try Yasuda and maybe even Fujitsu. Fujitsu? Maybe Mats Matsuhita? So, I definitely want at least Yasuda with us. Yeah, I definitely want them at least with us. Even though that still might not be enough. In order to make Guangdong an integral part of the Japanese sphere, we'll need to work as closely as possible with Yasuhita. 
Oh, yes, we do. Yes, we do. The corporations on the ins and outs of the Inuit government back in the home islands, fostering relations with them, would likely grant substantial, substantially more influence than we currently hold. Must remind those in charge of Yasuda that our partnership benefits both sides. In fact, we should go further still and make sure that we are on the same page in regards to our most recent initiative. This may cause some consternation with Masushita, but he will, he will have to ac accept being held out of the spotlight. For now, this seems to be an acceptable cost for a regime. Um, amendments. Heightens scrutiny upon factors regarding occupational safety. So, this wolf is not in session. Do you see gameplay effects? Uh, proposal to revise labor standards ordinance. Today in Legislative Council, Chief Executive Suzuki Taichi introduced a bill without proceeding, without precedent, in the short history of the state of Guangdong, or perhaps in the entire co prosperity sphere. The proposed revised labor standards ordinance was just right enough to give. Uh, <clears throat> Workers a taste of tolerable treatment, keeping them docile at a reasonable cost. Within the proposal were guarantees of maximum work days and mandated days off, as well as guidelines for increased scrutiny on Guangdong's firms about uh, seeing their enforcement. The Legislative Council's work was varied, but relatively peaceful compared to some of the more vigorous, as it were, sessions, which tend to be more reminiscent of the old Polish Parliament than anything. Morita Akio of Sony was cautiously receptive, saying that this was a necessary first step on building a more humane and therefore uh, more profitable Guangdong. Matsushita Masaharu of Matsushita was more resistant, but Reticent, politely voicing his reservations and the stereotypical conservative concerns of where will we get the money and what disabling effects can this have. Matsuzawa Takuji of Yasuda merely nodded along to anything Suzuki said while Ibuka Masaru of Fujitsu at once mocked Suzuki for proposing it and Morita for supporting it, denouncing the idea as nonsense and denying that there was even a need to resort to an ordinance in the first place. All told, the matter was peaceful. There were disagreements, but nothing theatrical took place. Oddly good behavior for a lot of the corporate vultures Suzuki thought. So passing this will give us the following facts. Slightly decreases workday, unlimited workday, and slightly increases minimum wage. Everyone say gets more Chinese support. How do we get more support? I still want even though it's just add more corruption, which I don't like, but it does give us more monthly support, which isn't very nice too, but um <clears throat> I'd like to do that one too, but I still want to take down corruption more too. We're looking actually pretty good. We need to find a mountain conditions though. So, the blue one would be probably good to do as well. That's five Sony seats in support. Well, they don't have five seats. Well, we could get more. It would be nice, but still. I have support from two factions. Morita Akeo, president of Sony, has done what so few Japanese businessmen have ever, ever been willing to consider. Namely, making Guangdong the home of the com companies. As confidence in our nation is certainly appreciated, however, Morita holds substantial grudges against other members of the establishment of the Legislative Council, especially Ibuka Masaru, who forced exile upon him all those years ago. Morita's simmering anger for the people of who Suzuki will need help keep on side will somewhat take away from the amount the chief executive can openly support him. Nevertheless, Morita is one of the openly outspoken supporters of the reformance of the council. Surely you will see merit in Suzuki's, uh, Suzuki's proposal. A day in the life. Lam Ha Sion took one more glance at the freshly torn envelope in his hand with what little cash left within, and written, handwritten on it was an all too familiar line of address, his one remaining anchor to the distant patch of soil he called home. He only hoped the amount of, he was sent was enough for them to get by. The black, male blackout since three weeks ago is growing more worrisome by the day. Pushing such concerns out of his thoughts, he lifted his head and stepped across the threshold to the Cha Chong Tang. Greeting him as he strolled into the cramped dining hall were the all too familiar mixtures of odors and all too familiar yells and chatters of perfect Cantonese and the all too familiar faces of his colleagues. Their features all too wrinkled to give away one bit of youthfulness. As Alam returned their exhausted greetings, the desperate visages of that young countryman and his aging mother flashed back to his mind. How he wished he could give his family his wishes, but then he'd be lying to himself. For he knew what awaited those indigenous folks, as the higher ups called them. It could only be a factory after factory, as far as I could see, eager to squash them into the cogs of the industrial machines and a little else. As well as meager Japanese skills that rescued him from the dis from his disaster of a business venture back in Hong Kong. After all, and quite frankly, with anyone with a fortune to possess such resources would be doomed to the bottom of the pyramid for the rest of their lives. As Lam gobbled away at his plate of egg and meat uh, chung fam, something right outside the glass panes caught his eye. A slender, feminine figure clad in pale, pale blue kimono, peeking inside with almost curious wonder. The next moment she was gone, swept away by another towering, sharply dressed figure. For a long, could spare much slight about a tuck on his shoulder. There had been another accident, another body to pull off the nets. So Officer Hayashi shrugged, abandoning his plate and hurried out into the afternoon lights. Perhaps that was just another Japanese tourist, an all too familiar sight. Advancement? Sometime after the forest resettlement, the Lee family was immersed uh, full force in the harsh light of the average Koshu worker. Lee Chun was no exception. Within weeks of moving to the city, he was working back breaking hours in a Japanese owned factory, mistakes were immediately docked from his pay. 
uh, which was a disastrous given that his pay was barely enough for rent as it was. Chilin was desperate. He wanted to make some more money, he would be recognized. He saw an improvement that could be made in the process and pointed out to the Zhu Jin foreman a man who called himself Saga. The man nodded appreciatively and said his thanks. So at that, Chun's heart rose hopefully. Maybe this might even earn him some more pay, enough to feed him feed his family. Maybe it might even be enough to send Y and Hei to school. In retrospect, Chun would say he should have realized that it wasn't to be. The next day, Chun heard and saw Zhu Jin's supervisor getting a pat on the back from the Japanese foreman as the process that Chun had suggested was implemented across the factory. As Chun realized that the Zhu Jin dude had taken the credit for himself, his role became great and his dejection deepened. He didn't even bother focusing for the rest of the day. Mistakes matter or not, there's no hope anyway. At last, that's how it works. Not bad. Ah, uh, we're not fighting there, but we're fighting down here. Um, what are you guys doing? Are you you guys are getting attacked? We still need to advance here too. But they keep attacking us, so a reliable agreement. A couple of faint knocks uh, disrupted Suzuku's. Ugh, I keep calling some Suzuku for some reason. Suzuki's. And says some work. Heralding the arrival of Imperius Matsuzawa Takujiya, the face of the company that was most inclined to support the RS RLSO. Uh, I ask you to be here to confirm your support for the RSLO, Suzuki ventured. I'm sure that would be no problem, considering our previous agreements. Matsuzawa replied with a faint but seemingly congenial smile. Of course, I'm not a person to actively renege on the past commitments. I'm aware that your project has been quite controversial, especially among the older companies. Rest assured, Yasuda will not be heavily affected. A bank pays his profession as well. Suzuki relaxed in his chair. The support of Yasuda is seemingly scared, however. Continued Matsuzawa. I do have a certain concern. Due to the nature of our business, we may rely on other companies and firms for profit, and this accidentally disrupts the profitability of several companies and firms. We may have an issue. Still, I think our partnership will prove to be fruitful. I look forward to working with you, Suzuki. As our business concluded an hour later, Matsuzawa gave the chief executive a firm handshake before leaving behind. A parting message, just one thing, Suzuki. I will uphold my part of the agreement, and I hope that you will help uphold yours. Do not dare to go beyond my back and deceive me. Remember that I answer directly to Tokyo. Yasuda has a long memory, and I'll be around longer after I or you are done here. With that, good day. Matsuzawa will close the door gently behind him, and leaving Suzuki alone in the office, confused as if he should feel ecstatic or anxious, and insurance and a warning. Consider the lances and stances of executive's opinions on labor rights when gathering support. Well, I should have not done that one. I'll do a meeting with Maverick, definitely. Uh, educate the engineer. Uh, mm. Well, or educate the engineer. Hmm. Well, on the surface, Ibuka Masaru, the engineer genius and the head of uh, Fujitsu, represents the most immovable opposing force of Suzuki's reformist efforts. Uh, he has dedicated much of his time in Guangdong, squeezing every penny out of profit he can out of the nation's lax labor laws, as well as encouraging more of the colleagues in Japan to join him in doing business in China. So whether the chief executive likes it or not, Ibuka and his opposition to any and all reform is here to stay for the foreseeable future, yet it may also be the key to passing the reform of Guangdong's labor standards to really need. Suzuki knows there must be something he can offer him in return, perhaps research subsidies or new facilities, maybe even a good word on the path in Tokyo. Due to the Ibuka, we'll rile up other members of the Legislative Council, Morita Akeo in particular, but if Ibuka can be brought over to the reformist side just this once, the rest of the reluctant opposition will surely follow. Or we do co hold court with the air. As heir to the prestigious electronic manufacturer Matsushita Electric, Matsushita Masaru, Masaharu's voice carries great weight inside the Legislative Council and the wider Japanese community. The position has helped develop persistent vigilance against movements that may negatively impact what will soon be his company. Therefore, Suzuki's reforms will unfortunately not be welcomed by Masushita. The position of an heir is highly precarious, no matter how hard Matsushita uh, tries to cement his position. He could always use some of assistance, and who better to help him than the chief executive himself? Yasuda may, may raise concerns with the future of the established relationship with Suzuki, though these qualms will have to be accepted, and the support of the heirs will be gained. So, it seems like we can't win anyways. Like, it's just not enough to get anything passed. How do I get anything passed? I want to pass it no matter what. So we need 50 seats, but we don't have 50 seats. Um, a red envelope campaign? Well, we've expanded significant political capital acquiring the ne votes needed to pass the revised labor standards ordinance. There's so many who remain opposed to our initiative. To shore up our position and ensure that nothing goes awry when a bill comes up in the council, some unhindered methods must be needed. An expensive gift, new car, and all expense paid vacation to Okinawa. It's amazing how much more pliable people become once a little persuasion has been done. This initiative, however, will not be cheap, and if we have failed to gather necessary votes beforehand, our, the drain on our treasury will be substantial. Outside looking in. Uh, Yoshiko, come on, stop staring. Uh, Baron Yasukawa's voice carried clearly from ten paces ahead on the crowded Koshu Street, where Yasukawa, Yoshiko, now dressed in a pale blue kimono, peered into the deepened Cha Chang Tang. Uh, just looking, Father Yoshiko. Yoshiko walked briskly back to her father's side, the kimono's folds holding her heart. Two short, rapid strides, kicking up dust from the streets. It's not odd to want to see how people live their lives outside Japan, is it? 
You shouldn't be close to the Chinese. There's no reason to be. Baron Yasukawa admonished Yoshiko. Yoshiko, they do the job, we do ours. It's how things work. Yes, father. Yoshiko demurred for a second before she looked back at their seating eatery. The people inside looked tired, father, but they were lively. A dozen tables were without an empty seat, all speaking over each other, nothing like home. Baron Yasukawa frothed a flush of irritation on his face. You don't know the Chinese at all. Don't pretend that you do. Well, then what about our valet? He spoke Japanese and seemed perfectly nice. Yoshiko countered. What do they call? What are they called? Zushin? The people here can't all be bad. They're none of your concern, Yoshiko. We're going back to Japan tomorrow. Baron Yasukawa declared while pulling at Yoshiko's hand. You don't have to worry about this world like you did in college. You're a daughter of the Yasukawa family. You'll probably never come back here again once you're married. Yoshiko closed it, chose to be silent, her mind elsewhere, above and beyond. I beg your pardon, Suzuki murmured almost instinctively, knowing perfectly well that was coming his way. Another barrage of demands, another manifestation of Morita uh, Akio's affinity for radicalism that had made itself painstakingly known during all those past months. Promise me that you won't force worker protection regulations on any and all firms within the border. No exceptions. Then we'll talk. Uh, before him, the head of the Sony Corporation sat squarely on his familiar sofa, eyes fixed intently on the chief executive, limbs and posture perfectly upright. Quite the characters ever, Suzuki pondered, an obstinate mule who just happens to have his mind in the right place. Most certainly, Suzuki aside, you do realize universal worker protection is the, the very crux of the RSLO. RLSO, yes? Compliance is non negotiable, even if I were to personally think otherwise. Uh, I'm not saying that you'd be the one to tear it all up. Morita's gaze remained unwavering, just by the wave of a relief seemingly rippling across the body. But you know who would? Ibuka Masaru. The O Almighty know it all that just went shit about his glass in the door. Our new order. Should his unapologetic cheap labor exploitation run unchecked, I'm, I'm certain he'll end up with a substantially lower production cost than the rest of us, and this how we turn the RLSO a little more than a bang link piece of paper in terms of fairness and practicality. And why don't play right into its hands? With this, Morita leaned forward, and the gaze from his bespeckled eyes growing ever, ever more fiercer. So please, for the sake of everyone, don't let that weasel lay his hands on the deal, ever. The sudden outburst of venom in his words made Suzuki flinch. That man would have stopped it at Sony, he'll gladly screw over the rest of us for as long as he's alive. Uh, a sure thing, as we do, well, we'll do the Red Envelope campaign after we might change, uh, do this as possible, maybe, foster relations, their partnership benefits both sides, um, court with the heir, huh, no matter how, yeah, we might want to do this one instead, a necessary arrangement, unnecessary arrangement, Matsushita Masaharu, the president and representative director of the Matsushita Electric Corporation, had a supercilious smile resting on his lips as he sat opposite Suzuki. Chief Executive, I'm assuming that I've been called here to discuss the matters of the Labor Act. Suzuki responded with a simple nod, prompting Matsushita to follow up. Why have you decided to request the support of Matsushita? Our history has not always been the most smooth after all. Why not request the support of Yasuda? They've always been your biggest allies in the council, if I'm not mistaken. Suzuki took a few seconds to consider his response, even as uh, Matsushita's calm, calculating demeanor unsettled him. I've decided as a wiser decision to employ the help of your corporation rather than try and convince immovable hardliners like Ibuka and Fujitsu, or the over lenient liberals like Morita and Sony. Matsushita seemed seemingly contemplating his choices, likely analyzing every word that came out of Suzuki's mouth. I believe an agreement can certainly be reached, but at a price, of course. I'd like your backing in the future endeavors in the council with access equal uh, to or greater than given to Yasuda. Your act hurts our profits and growths for our cats, and so these requests are necessary, I'm sure you can understand. A look at relief appeared on Suzuki's face, of course. I'm glad we can come to an agreement. As Matsushita walked out of the office, Suzuki's mind remained fixated on his uncanny, unbreakable smile. He could not shake the feeling that if he left his back unguarded, that he might find a dagger protruding from it with a little warning. With no warning, really. And now we wait. Commis commiseration session. You should have seen those complaints coming. A sigh escaped Khan Si Hing's mouth, really audible among the clinking within the cafeteria. You know, parents lose their minds whenever they hear the word Japanese and imperialism next to one another. Not giving a crap about stupid people is the whole point of academia. Suzuda Hayoto tosses his chopsticks aside. The home islands are a lost cause in that regard, and that's why I'm down here in the south in the first place. He said that his Zujin colleague sitting opposite him. You're not standing with those people all of a sudden, are you? Do I look like I have much of a choice? Xiu Hing gazed back and held a cup of tea to his mouth, and apparently you went on and on in class about how Zujin was an artificial construct. But guess what? There's one sitting in front of you right now, he chuckled. I knew that I, when I signed up for back in 1956. I knew that for all the opportunities and incentives the newborn leg co dangled in front of us, all the Japanese language professionally mattered in the end. I had to speak the same tongue as your Pan-Asian brothers and acquiesce in the same new orders they all do, just get a job better than the blue collars. You could not have done something back then, Hayato kept his glare, protested, stood your ground, anything, and applying for Zujin just happened to be that something, didn't it? See, see Hing leaned back in his chair. We live in reality, Hayato, where piety to ethnic labels can only get a Chinese person like me so far. Uh, and I'm sure many others thought the same too. Otherwise, Zujin as a concept would have never lived on. I wouldn't be able to sit here, at least with the consolation of knowing that nobody like us exists on any other corner of the planet. 
So no, I just can't lash out like some raging and tell a maniac of what little I've been given. He gave him his companion's buffalo eyes. That is a Japanese man the luxury. Japanese man's luxury, yeah. Can't do anything about corruption for now. But happy December, everybody. Happy December. Corruption went up more. God dang it. Opinions are 40%, though. And their opinions are 80%, which is pretty good. Italy now has won the border war, but we'll see what happens. Last minute persuasion. Suzuki app apprehensively. Uh, paces around the expansive office during an unusually silent evening. He had another cigarette clinging to his mouth. He vigorously attempted to recall all the events that had led up to the moments over the past months. His dealings with the tycoons are attempts to short public support. Uh, the Legislative Council was undoubtedly vote upon the status of the RLSO very soon, vote upon the fate of the magnum opus and assets it may affect. He was certainly very tired without he would contribute anything to ensure that Labor Act passes. Suzuki, in his back and forth, opens an unassuming drawer on his desk. The drawer contains several red envelopes, a traditional East Asian custom of exchanging money as gifts. Suzuki ponders over the idea of possibly persuading certain figures with these red envelopes. Filled, of course. The red envelopes will certainly be a boon to his efforts. Just gaining last minute supporters is never a bad thing. Suzuki continues to contemplate if he should utilize the envelopes as it could damage his image if news of it ever got out, and the amount it could be given out could be costly. Despite his deliberation, he would soon make his decision definitive. No matter what it would take, he would get the RLSO pass. Frugality is necessary. Um, is there anything else we can do here? No? no, no. Call the vote. Voting on the council on the ordinance will commence when the focus is selected. The voting period will be in 10 days instead of the usual 30 due to the extraordinary ordinance. Well, is there anything else we can do about votes and buying votes? Okay. 55? How do we get 55? Suzuki Yasuda. I'll call the vote. Weeks of backroom meetings, politicking, and vote gatherings come to this. Voting on the revised Labor Standards Ordinance has finally begun the Legislative Council with it, which will help ensure Guangdong's future stability and prosperity, no matter the grumblings of agitators or stubborn executives. A die has been cast, we've been sure that the game has been rigged from the start. An invitation to Sing King. An invitation to Manchukuo's China's economic conference has recently been delivered to a government, and a few typical Manchurian perfidity. A arrived months late, so it's been sent out our, our sending our diplomatic team scrambling, the rats, and Xi King have even dared to put the blame on us for being late to put an end in an RSVP. Despite their attempts to hinder us, we'll not be made fools of. A delegation will be selected and dispatched in all due haste, and we'll share the world Guangdong's finest. And of course, this leaves the matter of who we are going to be accompanying to the conference wide open. Uh, wide open, we'll have to decide quickly. It passes. Uh, it was a sunny day in the Legislative Council, of course, and the Chief Executive Suzuki Taichi colored himself pleased. His proposal just right enough to give workers a taste of tolerable treatment, keeping them docile at a reasonable cost of past. Granted, the Legislative Council was divided on the matter, but then it was always was. At least we're not squabbling too violently. Matsuwa Takuji and Yasuda, as always willing to sycophants to Suzuki's rule, were politely applauding, and Suzuki could tell that some of them even meant it. Morita, Akio, and his reformist Sunni delegates, on the other hand, were in jubilation, celebrating what they called important and long overdue progress, or at least pro prosaically, a big effing deal. On the other hand, Matsushita Masaharu and his lot were much calmer, offering superficial congratulations that Suzuki could tell none of them meant sincerely. The view of the Ibuka's men that did not file out in silence were much the same. Ibuka, on the other hand, was far blunter, coming up to Suzuki in the lane and saying, Alright, you'll pay for this. This isn't over. Suzuki wasn't entirely pleased, though. After all, he had to compromise on his own ends of sense of business integrity. That is, bend over by using bribes to get the bill passed, but they say he had succeeded. That was more worth than any uh, betrayed principles. Cheers, he thought. Nice. That was difficult to do. Parlay with the Manchurian hosts, consult the Japanese, approach the Chinese. That's all the Japanese. Japan, the masters of Asia, none of us. While we are unquestionably tightly bound our masters in Tokyo, we have few opportunities to meet with the Empire face to face. Let's go an opportunity cannot be squandered. We'll meet the Japanese representatives and see what our masters wish of us in exchange, of course. We also acquire the backing of the Empire of the Rising Sun and the support for us, and Guangdong's Japanese expatriates will be unquestionably valuable. But we've got to end the episode there. If you enjoyed the video, though, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below. Please pray so that we can lower corruption more, and I'll see you tomorrow to see what else we can do with. The good old state of Guangdong. Thanks for watching. Have a great, great, great rest of your day.